History tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in Central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spooktacular people, and welcome to this sixth episode of the History Goes Bump podcast. Ghost tours for the theater of the mind. I am your host, Diane. And this is Denise. And we are so glad to have you all with us this evening. Tonight, our focus is going to be on... Urban legends. And one particular urban legend... Bloody Mary. Indeed. We're going to be talking about the legend of Bloody Mary this evening. I bet that all takes you back to a time when you were maybe, I don't know, 12, 13, maybe even before that. A bunch of little giggly girls sitting around in a room together and deciding to challenge each other's courage. Before we get into that, we want to make sure you check out our website at historygoesbump.com. You can find everything you want to know about the show there from the various places that you can find the podcast to our blog and also our emporium. We also would love to get your feedback. You can do that by emailing us at historygoesbump at gmail.com and we would love your reviews at both iTunes and Stitcher. We'd greatly appreciate anything that uh, you would like to contribute there. We had a fabulous interview on the Right Stream Radio Network. If you weren't able to catch that live, you can catch it in archive. Just head over to blogtalkradio.com, put Right Stream, W R I T E S T R E A M in the search box. You should be able to find it there. I also have it linked up on our blog, on the Facebook page, and we are going to be starting two different kinds of newsletters. Of course, you've heard about the one that will have exclusive content for members of the Spooktacular crew, but we thought it would be nice to do just a general info newsletter for people who maybe aren't on social media so that they know when we have a show that comes up or any information like when we're doing interviews or having meetups, that kind of thing. So we'll make sure that it's all in that newsletter. So make sure that you send your email address to us if you want to be a part of that. I am working on getting a subscription button up on the website as well. Today's moment in oddity, the tale of the king and the restaurant owner. One day, King Umberto I, the king of Italy, decided to have dinner at a restaurant that he had never been to before. As the king ate, he caught a glimpse of the restaurant owner and asked for the owner to join him at his table. The king was intrigued because the restaurant owner could have been the king's twin brother. As the men talked with each other, they discovered that they both were born on the exact same date. Not only that, but both men were married to women who shared the same name. The restaurant was opened on the exact same day that the king took the throne as well. The men parted ways later that day. Sometime later, the restaurant owner was involved in a shooting accident that resulted in his death. King Umberto received the news on the same day, and as he listened, an assassin shot him and killed him. Thus, both men died on the same day. What an odd coincidence. Or was it? Pull the covers up tight. That chill you feel isn't the air conditioning. <laughs> this day in history. It was a cool October day. Monday the 23rd of October to be exact, and Indiana's most infamous outlaw was about to make his move in 1933. A black Studebaker pulls up to a hill outside of Central National Bank in Greencastle, Indiana at 2.45 p.m. Inside the vehicle are John Dillinger's gang, which include Russell Clark, Harry Pierpont, Harry Copeland, Charles Mackley, Red Hamilton, 
and either Hilton Crouch or Leslie Homer. This is going to be the gang's first major robbery. Pierpont approaches the teller's window and asks for a change for a $20 bill, and when he was directed to another area, he pulled out the gangster's weapon of choice, a Tommy gun. The rest of the gang pulled out their Tommy guns, and the vaults are emptied in five minutes. The total take was $75,000, and no shots were fired, which was a good thing since the police station was right across the street. Also, since we are Disney nuts, Walt Disney's Dumbo was released on this day in 1941. to History Goes Bump. All right. Well, if you grew up in America, you are very familiar with urban legends. Urban legends are basically the folklore of a young country like America. You know, when you're over in Europe and various other places, China, probably Asia, anywhere in Asia, their legends go back centuries and maybe even more than that. I'm sure that they go back more than that. And they're, they're not quite as urban as ours, but a young country has young legends. Most of these types of legends get their start mostly from true tales that get twisted, turned, and added to over the years and change based on the storyteller's flourish for hyperbole and dramatics. These tales become legends because the origin is untraceable and are generally handed down from person to person and the use of urban, as Denise just mentioned, is mainly meant to convey that these stories are more modern rather than something that has taken place in an urban setting. Uh, if you think back to some urban legends, you know that they may have taken place in the countryside or something of that nature. So it doesn't necessarily mean that these are all straight out of a city. Most of us have gone through various sleepover rituals based on urban legends and told or heard various stories around the campfire. That's one of our favorite things to do when we're camping, especially in a group, is telling stories around the campfire. These types of things are a rite of passage. You may recall playing a game called Light as a Feather, Stiff as a Board, Truth or Dare, or perhaps you even dug out the Ouija board. There were the stories of the hook or the woman in white hitchhiking who disappears once she's dropped off at a cemetery. And who can forget the story of the babysitter who gets the call from a creepy man asking about the children in the house. And a trace on the call reveals that he is actually in the house. Wait, but I don't think that one's an urban legend because when you did your Halloween show, one of our friends called in and that actually is based on a true story that happened to her and her brother. Yeah, so it was very fascinating to hear that and... You know, I've heard people say, well, that story can't be true because the police can't trace calls that are coming out of the same house or the police couldn't get there that quickly, blah, 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 blah. But if you think about the story, supposedly the way it goes is that this is a home that has two different lines because I believe the father needed a business line or something. And so that's why he's able to make a phone call from inside the house. He's using the other phone line. Now, most of you may recall that the story goes something like this. A married couple are going out for an evening. They've had your basic teenage babysitter come in to take care of their three children. She's told, we'll be back late. The kids are already asleep, so don't worry about checking in on them or anything. Just She basically has to just hang out and do her homework, which is what she does. Phone ring. <phone rings> she answers it, but she hears nothing on the other end. Silence. Then it just hangs up. After a few more minutes, the phone rings again. <phone rings> She answers. This time there's a man on the line. You know, he's got that chilling voice. Have you checked on the children? And then click. First, she thinks it might have been the father calling to check up and he got interrupted. So she ignores it. Starts doing her homework again. Then the phone rings again. Have you checked on the children? Mr. Murphy. Then the caller hangs up again. She decides to phone the restaurant where their parents said they'd be dining, but when she asks for Mr. Murphy, she's told that he and his wife had left the restaurant 45 minutes earlier. So she calls the police and reports that a stranger's been calling her and hanging up. Has he threatened you, the dispatcher asks? No, she says. Well, there's nothing we can really do about it. You could try reporting the prank caller to the phone company. A few minutes go by and she gets another call. Why haven't you checked on the children? Who is this? Hangs up 
again. So then she dials 911 and says, I'm scared. I know he's out there. He's watching me. The dispatcher, have you seen him? The babysitter says no. Well, there isn't much we can do about it. The babysitter goes into a panic mode, pleads with her to help her. Now, now it'll be okay, says the dispatcher. Give me your phone number, street address, and if you can keep this guy on the phone for at least a minute, we'll try to trace the call. What was your name again? Linda. Okay, Linda, if he calls back, we'll do our best to trace the call, but just keep calm. Can you do that for me? Yes, she says and hangs up. She decides to turn the lights down so she could see if anyone's outside. Is that what she would do, Denise? No, I think I would be gathering the kids up and getting the heck out of the house. And of course she gets another call. It's me. Why did you turn the lights down? Can you see me? Yes. Look, you've scared me. I'm shaking. Are you happy? Is that what you wanted? No. Then what do you want? Your blood all over me. So she slams the phone down, terrified. Almost immediately, it rings again. (laughs) Leave me alone! She screams, but it's a dispatcher calling back. His voice is urgent. Linda, we've traced that call. It's coming from another room inside the house. Get out of there now. So she tears to the front door, trying to unlock it, dashing outside, only to find that the chain at the top is still latched. In the time it takes her to unhook it, she sees a door open at the top of the stair. Light streams from the children's bedroom, revealing the profile of a man standing just inside. She finally gets the door open and bursts outside, only to find a cop standing on the doorstep with his gun drawn. At this point, she's safe, of course, but when they capture the intruder and drag him downstairs in handcuffs, she sees he's covered in blood. Come to find out, all three children have been murdered. Do you remember that story from your youth? I definitely do, and I do remember a variation of that story being put on the big screen. Indeed, there was uh, a movie called When a Stranger Calls, and it's basically based on that. There was also a remake in 2006 of that movie. Pretty freaky stuff. But these are just a few of the urban legends out there. As I mentioned, light as a feather, stiff as a board. How many of you played that when you were a little kid? And did it kind of freak you out? Did it work? First of all, I do recall it working once for us. And what's unique about this game, and for some older people who might be listening that have no idea what I'm talking about, basically, you have one child lay on the ground, they pretend that they're dead and get as stiff as a board, and the rest of the children gather all around and they place one or two fingers underneath the body of the individual who's laying prone. Then they all start chanting, light as a feather, stiff as a board. Light as a feather, stiff as a board. And then after they chanted for a while, they all try to lift that person. And indeed, it does work. Now, one of the things, they call it kind of a levitation trick. One of the reasons why they think this is something that works, why this phenomenon works, is described on Wikipedia as this. In many versions, each of the five people sitting around the other person uses only one or two of his own fingers on each hand to do the lifting. It is particularly easy to lift a heavy weight when it's evenly distributed amongst a group of four people. The phenomenon of the weight seems less on the second try around or after some sort of ritual is due to increased focus and the lifters being more in sync with one another. One of the best rational explanations for such reports is that the participants are tricking their minds by way of chanting into believing that the person being lifted is light as a feather. The body still reacts to the command from the brain, but the mind perceives it differently. Simply put, five people can easily lift one person, especially when those five people are tricking their minds into thinking that the person is light in weight. Another reason for the apparent success of levitation is the self-fulfilling prophecy concept. The lifters know a human being is too heavy to lift with a fingertip, so subconsciously they may not exert enough effort on the first attempt. After the ritual... The participants may believe that the body is now supposed to move or that the ritual itself has given them power and therefore they exert enough effort to raise the participant off the ground. And this thing goes all the way back to the time when the plague was broken out in London. So that's how old that is. Now, I also mentioned the hook. Do you remember that story, Denise? I do indeed. That one used to really freak me out. Okay, so I think kind of how it went is that typical scene Lovers are hanging out on Lover's Lane, and they're doing what lovers do, making out or something. Wait, be careful. This is a G-rated show. (laughs) I I don't think this is a G-rated show by any means. Oh, okay. Then continue. All right. So we're PG-13-ish. And again, they were making out. I didn't say anything else. What were you thinking, gutter brain? 
I wasn't thinking anything. It's just that you were hesitating and getting the music going. So, you know. I didn't know I was getting the chubunk, chubunk, chubunk. I don't know how does that porn music go, but I'm sure that wasn't it. I wouldn't know. <laughs> anyway, so let's rewind back. We've got two lovers hanging out on Lover's Lane kissing, and they hear a news report come across on the radio. Somebody has escaped from the psych prison. The thing that's unique about this person who's escaped is that instead of a hand, they have a hook. And no, Denise, it's not Captain Hook. Not Captain Hook. That's the only hook that there is. Of course, I like him because he's a villain. But anyway, so this couple's listening to this report and they're getting a little bit worried because the prison is just up the road. And the report that's coming through is telling everybody, stay inside, keep your doors locked. This person is crazed and on the run. Well, they start to hear some banging around outside of the car and they get a little freaked out. They take off. They finally get home. And when they get outside of the car, they see something stuck on the side door. And what is it, Denise? It's a hook. So how close were they to death? Anyway, I think stories like that are probably supposed to be warnings to keep young people from hanging out at Lover's Lane kissing. Or listening to Diane's wonderful porn music. (laughs) Now, there is another story that completely freaks me out that we've heard before as well. And I'm wondering if some of you have heard this one. One of the freakiest movies I think we ever saw was called Los Turistos, I believe was the name of it. Do you remember how that movie went, Denise? That one I definitely remember. So Los Turistos, it goes back on an urban legend that we're going to tell you about. But the premise of the movie is there are some young travelers in a foreign country. I believe their van gets stuck or in a wreck or something. But anyway, they're kind of out and about and they find some people just partying on the beach. And so they join join the party. They're drinking with them, you know, just having fun. Bonfires in the beach. Well, when they wake up, all their identification's gone and they're stranded and everybody's gone. So they're stranded in a foreign country. They don't know the language and they have no identification. What ends up happening is they end up getting hunted down um, for their organs. And it just kind of goes on from there with just um, trying to, to get out of the country and then people being abducted and then trying to get their, their organs taken out of them and feeling helpless and not knowing what they can do. So it was a completely freak out movie for that. I don't like those kind of movies at all. Yeah. So this wasn't a movie that was like gory or, you know, Jason Friday the 13th or Freddy Krueger. But to me, it was one of the most terrifying movies I'd ever seen. Because first of all, how scary would it be to be, say, in drug infested with tons of cartels, Colombia, with no ID, not knowing where you are, no money, no phones, nothing. You've got the clothes on your back and you're in a jungle. And then on top of that, you've got this black market organ ring going on. I mean, it's just a terrifying thing. So this harkens back to an urban legend about the kidney thieves. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard this story as well. We have a victim. Let's call him Bob. He's on a business trip alone somewhere in Europe. He goes out to have some cocktails at a bar. Wouldn't you know it, he wakes up the next morning in an unfamiliar hotel room with severe pain in his lower back. He's taken to the emergency room where doctors determine that unbeknownst to him, Bob had undergone major surgery the night before. One of his kidneys has been removed cleanly and professionally. I've also heard another one where, again, our friend Bob is hanging out in the bar And here's a beautiful woman who seduces him and takes her to her room. Again, he passes out in the room. But in this version, he wakes up in an ice bath in the bathroom. And there's a note there telling him to call 911 immediately because his kidneys have been removed. So it's pretty chilling. That's how these urban legends get started. And then they start to almost become real. As a matter of fact, there is one urban legend that has become real and has made the news in the past couple of months. You may have heard the story of Slender Man. This is a monster type character. It's a really tall man with very long arms, wears a hat, kind of a shadowy figure. He was a creation on the internet. There was a a website that was looking for people to send in their scariest stories that they were going to make up some kind of an urban legend. And one of the guys on that website submitted this story and had pictures and elaborate story and then everybody kind of contributed. And over time, it seems to have taken on a life of itself so much to the point that there's been two different crimes committed in the past few months with girls, teenage girls involved, blaming Slenderman for their crimes, that they were doing the attempted murders 
One of them was a couple of girls stabbed a friend of theirs multiple, multiple times. She survived. They blamed it on Slenderman. And there was a young girl who tried to burn her mother and brother up in a house fire. And she too said she was doing it to honor Slenderman. So sometimes these urban legends can take on a life of their own in a very scary way. One of the most infamous urban legends that we're going to talk about is this game that was played in the bathroom with a mirror based on the legend of Bloody Mary. So the story behind Bloody Mary has various versions, just like all urban legends, and there are two main women that the tale could be based upon. The first is a woman who was really called Bloody Mary, and that is Mary I, the Queen of England from 1553 to 1558. The moniker was based upon the fact that she had Protestants executed. In just five years, she had 280 people burned at the stake. Her parentage did not help either since Henry VIII was her father. The tragedy of Queen Mary I is that she was never able to carry a child to full term. It is said that asking Bloody Mary about her children gets a nasty response. The second woman that the tale is based upon is the one that is most likely the true origin and has various versions as well. That's one thing about urban legends. It's hard to peg them down because they have been so changed through the years. One such version is about a woman who lived during the Civil War named Mary Worth. She was believed to be a witch and committed heinous acts during her lifetime. A favorite pastime for her was to kidnap runaway slaves and torture them in her barn. She used the slaves in black magic rituals as well. Eventually, the townspeople burned her at the stake. Another version of the tale comes from across the pond in England during the 13th century. Apparently, a witch there calling herself Mary was abducting and killing young girls and the townspeople there burned her at the stake as she hurled curses at them. And then there is the Mary Worth, who was a woman disfigured at a young age. Irregardless of which of these tales is the origin, the name Mary is stuck. In all stories, Mary is buried in a cemetery local to where the urban legend is being told. In one such city, a red tombstone with no name has been reported to be the grave of Mary Worth, and people leave trinkets and sometimes practice witchcraft at the gravesite. Here is where the urban legend and sleepover rituals come into the picture. Summoning Bloody Mary in a bathroom mirror is considered a test of courage. The ritual dates back to the 1960s, and the superstition about mirrors dates back to ancient times. It's believed that spirits can be trapped in mirrors because their reflection confuses them, and the boundary of the mirror frame locks them inside the mirror. Just like the mirror in Snow White. You know what's fascinating about you pointing that out, Denise? That is one of the things that comes up when you look at the superstitions around mirrors. That's why... There was the mirror mirror on the wall. It was the spirit that was trapped in the mirror. This is why superstitious folks will not buy antique mirrors and possibly why breaking a mirror is bad luck because a spirit has been freed. Folklorist Janet Longlois wrote an essay about Bloody Mary in 1978 and the more recent movie Candyman was clearly inspired by the Bloody Mary ritual. The actual ritual goes something like this and it's mostly done by girls. A young woman goes into a bathroom with no windows and no lights. She carries either a flashlight or a candle with her. She faces the mirror and calls out the name Bloody Mary three times, or 13 times based on the ritual being followed, and then either turns on the flashlight or holds up the candle, and it is said that she will see Bloody Mary in the mirror. If she doesn't look into Bloody Mary's eyes, Mary will tell her the future. If she does look Mary in the eye, Bloody Mary will scratch out her eyes or disfigure her or even kill her. At least that is how the story goes. In actuality, most girls run screaming from the bathroom because their own reflection in the mirror has caused their eyes to either hallucinate or play tricks on them. Sometimes the girls go into the bathroom as a group and hold hands in a circle while they chant together. What should give people pause about this type of ritual is the actual act of conjuring or divination that is being represented by the ritual. It is as if the mirror is being used used as a portal, and the girls are conjuring the spirit of Mary. This type of game could prove to be as dangerous as the use of a Ouija board, and this brings up a great point for anybody who's younger listening to this. I know that uh, Mattel and Hasbro, I think now Hasbro has the license for it, and Toys R Us sells them. They sell these Ouija boards, and they even make them so they're for little girls and little boys, pink and blue. These are not games, and they are not toys. Have you ever messed around with a Ouija board, Denise? Indeed, I have, but I think my messing around with Ouija boards ended shortly after I got to see the wonderful movie The Exorcist. There was one time, well, actually, there was a couple times that I... uh, 
was in the presence of a Ouija board. And I didn't really know what it was. I was staying at a friend's house and she said, hey, do you want to play this game? And I said, okay, sure. And I remember we were playing it and we were, she said, what you do is you ask the spirit what its name is. So I don't even remember. We'd asked and it had given us a name. We asked a few questions and I just remembered thinking, wow, she's pushing this little thing around to all these letters because I knew I wasn't doing it. Well, then we had a spirit come along that only had a single letter for its name. I'm not going to say it now. And she said, oh, we have to tell it goodbye right away. And I said, okay. Okay. And I said, well, why did we have to tell that one goodbye? And she goes, well, if they only go by a single letter, it means they're evil. Now, as far as I'm concerned, anything that you're talking to on the board is probably not good. And then we broke the board out again once um, I was in a sophomore in high school and we were building a float for homecoming and it was raining out. So we couldn't really do a lot of work on it. So we all gathered around a Ouija board then. And I was working the planchette and I was doing it with one of the football players who had never used a Ouija board as well. So he kept accusing me of pushing it around for all the answers. And of course, I'm thinking he's pushing it around. And it was then that I realized this thing is really doing something and this is not good and I've never touched another one again and never will and my recommendation is that nobody ever touch one of those things now because this type of game doing the Bloody Mary thing could be possibly doing some type of divination it could be why there are so many terrifying real life stories that are told about people who've experienced this now first before we get into some of these stories that I want to share did you ever try doing the Bloody Mary thing as a kid Denise yes we did I don't know that I ever I always just saw a dark mirror well, I saw me in the mirror with the flashlight, but um, we did have some people that would freak out. I just thought that they were like <laughs> babies. I was very much the same way. I um, I think both Denise and I come from the same place where we are skeptical believers. So we do believe in the supernatural, but we're pretty skeptical until you convince us of something. And so when we played this game in the bathroom, I never saw anything other than my weird looking face with a flashlight up against it. And when Diane says until we're convinced, we're not telling any spirits out there that they need to come convince. <laughs> <laughs> no. We're just saying that we're a little bit skeptical. So so that wasn't a challenge. No, no, I'm definitely not not doing any kind of a challenge there. But I'm just saying, you know, if we hear a place is haunted, I'm not necessarily going to jump to that. I'm going to check other things first. Like, you know, is the electrical system weird? Or I'm going to look for other, not necessarily debunk, because I don't really like that word, but I'm going to look for other causes before I jump to that. So going back to Bloody Mary... We're going to read a couple of stories that have been told about people's real life experiences. The first goes as such. I was nine when me and my friends tried doing Bloody Mary at my house one weekend. As well as I remember, there were five of us and we carried my mom's candles into the upstairs bathroom and all five of us were chanting Bloody Mary. We saw an old woman with cuts on her face and chains around her neck and shoulders look out of the mirror at us. Then the shower curtain went up in flames and we ran out of the bathroom. An older boy ran into the bathroom and luckily for us got the fire put out. We all got in big trouble for it and the parents thought we caught the shower curtain on fire with the candles, but we had the candles at least six feet from the shower curtain when it suddenly went up in flames. I know for a fact that we did not touch that shower curtain with a candle. I've always thought about it and I know that we saw Bloody Mary, but I've never been tempted to do it ever again. I was 25 this year and I remember it like it was yesterday. There were five of us girls there that night when we did Bloody Mary and had the fire in the bathroom and two of those girls who were my childhood friends died at different times and fire related accidents. I've been scared of fire all my life and I've never been tempted to do Bloody Mary again. I've always been afraid that we somehow caused the death of my two friends that night and I've been afraid of fire all my life. Another story reads as some of my friends, five of us, cramped ourselves into a small bathroom in my friend Catherine's house. We ended up saying Bloody Mary, more like chanting it, about 20 times or so for anything to appear. When we did finally see something, it started out as a green glow then the darkened portrait of a face became more visible. By that time, half of us were screaming, so we knocked each other down trying to get out of the bathroom, and then I flipped on the light. It was a welcome relief. Another story? I was only seven at the time. A few friends and I went into a bowling alley. Now, our parents belonged to a bowling group, so we just chilled at the arcade park. One of the other kids told us a story about Bloody Mary. My friends and I didn't believe them, so me and my two friends went into the men's restroom. All we had was a flashlight. We turned off all the lights and chanted, Bloody Mary, Bloody Mary, Bloody Mary. My one friend then flashed the flashlight on and quickly off. I looked at the mirror and there was a girl. She looked like she was in her early 20s. She was looking the other way, yet started to turn towards us. My friends and I bolted out of there before she attacked us like the legend says. After this experience, I feel like someone always watches me. I haven't tried contacting any other spirits after this. A few months after my friends did this, my dad died. Could she have driven him crazy enough to kill himself? 
Could the spirit be so full of rage it drives people to shoot themselves? Now, ever since this happened, my moods are different. I'm 15 and some days I'll just suddenly go into depression. Some days I just want to curl up and die. Could this be revenge for summoning her all those years ago? My friends who did this with me all stopped talking to me. I met one recently and she seems okay. Could I have been the only one who saw Bloody Mary? Could she only be after me? If she is, then why? This may have happened seven or eight years ago, but I still feel the effects. So those are just a few of the stories. Again, Denise and I never had anything and none of our friends ever experienced anything. So the mind can do funny things to a person. And psychology is a very unique science. So whether Bloody Mary really had anything to do with any of this, I don't know. But let this serve as a cautionary tale that maybe you shouldn't be playing, quote unquote, games like this. So for us to ask you, is the legend of Bloody Mary real? Does she really appear in the mirror to exact revenge? Is she just the figment of active imaginations? That is for you to decide. Well, that is it for the legend of Bloody Mary. We hope you enjoyed it. Of course, we love to get your feedback, and we'd also like your suggestions for future shows. Our next show is going to focus on the Velisca Axe Murder House. And while I know that may sound unappetizing to some people, it's an interesting story because not only is it a brutal crime, but it's an unsolved crime. So this is true crime, an unsolved mystery, and a haunting all wrapped into one in a historical setting. So you want to make sure you catch that. We also will have our Halloween special coming up on Halloween. And we would like to have your real life ghost stories that you'd like to share with us if you've had some kind of paranormal experience. We'd love to hear it. You are more than welcome to stay anonymous if you would like. We've already got three stories on tap for you. One of them's recorded and we've had two other ones that have come through, one of which wants to stay anonymous. So you're more than welcome to do that. We'd love to hear from you. Just email us at historyghostbump at gmail.com. Private message us on Facebook, something of that nature. And, uh, you know, we can either, you can send an MP3 if you want to, you can write up the story, or I can call you if you'd like and record you that way, whichever works best for you. And like Diane mentioned earlier in the show, um, be sure to let us know if you want to be part of the the newsletter that's going to talk about different things. We already have some things in the making to do some meetups, to do some ghost tours together. The first one will, will probably be in early December in St. Augustine, Florida. So if you're in the area, if you're not too far away, Georgia, Northern Florida, or even the Orlando area. It's not that far away. Keep your eyes out because we would love to have anybody who can join us. And we actually are going to be making a trip up to Atlanta and we're going to do a ghost tour up there. So if you are in the Atlanta area, let us know and we'll let you know what we're up to. Maybe you can tag along with us. All right. Well, that's it for us. Thanks so much for tuning in. This has been Diane and Denise. You take care now. Bye bye. Fan of the show? Subscribe to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast catcher. We would greatly appreciate your review at iTunes as well to help the show grow. Thank you. 